¿Cómo están? Me da muchísimo gusto darles la bienvenida a todos los que nos acompañan hoy aquí en el Guadalajara Film Festival. Yo soy Jimena Rutia, soy directora del festival y me siento profundamente orgullosa hoy de poderles presentar lo que será una sin duda de las charlas protagonistas este año en nuestro festival. No solamente es un placer tener a los ponentes que hoy nos acompañan y que dentro de un momento presentaré, pero también es un placer poder escuchar su visión con respecto al tema que hoy nos ocupa. Aspiration to Animation es el título que dimos a esta Masterclass y para hablar de ello no hay nadie más experto que la gente que rodea a Disney. Y es que ellos precisamente están aquí de la mano con nosotros hablando de esta que es una sin duda de, las, eh, de los géneros más interesantes para todos aquellos que tienen una edad pequeñita, pero también para todos nosotros que disfrutamos de estas películas. Así que me da muchísimo gusto presentar el día de hoy a Carlos López Estrada, que es el director de la nueva y muy esperada de película de Disney, Ryan and the Last Dragon. Está con nosotros también Osna Sherry, que es su productora y que es productora además de muchas películas de las que estoy segura que muchos de ustedes son Fans. Además, y nada menos así, eh, Julian Comet está aquí para moderar y platicar con ellos acerca de esta, que es uno de los géneros más afamados en la taquilla, pero también uno de los géneros que ha puesto en perspectiva las historias que, cuentan, que se cuentan para pequeños, pero que funcionan para grandes. ¿Cómo funciona todo este mundo que depende tanto de la tecnología? Hoy vamos a saber mucho al respecto y aquí doy eh, de verdad la bienvenida a cada uno de ellos y el agradecimiento profundo del festival por estar aquí con nosotros. Muchas gracias y bienvenidos. Well, on behalf of the festival, we'd like to welcome you. Thank you for joining us on this edition of the 10th edition of Fig in LA, now the Guadalajara Film Festival. The festival's new mission is to share the best of Latin American cinema and open doors to Latinx creators with the intention of cultivating a borderless industry. Today, you will listen to uh, a wonderful group speaking about aspirations through animation. And as we look at building the pipeline within the Latinx community, I think that this is a great chat to discuss how you can, you can have a story with a stronger in impact while going through animation. So we'll go ahead and let our moderator, Julian Cromet, VP of Multicultural Audience Engagement, take over. Great, thank you so much, Vanessa and Jimena, uh, for oh, having thank you. And, uh, and for that wonderful introduction. Hablo um, español también, so es fantástico hablar español inglés en un momento. So I just say thank you to you, you all for organizing such a marvelous festival with an incredible mission uh, that I, I think all three of us uh, feel so strongly about. So thank you all very much, mil gracias. Um, and uh, everybody who's watching, uh, we are so excited to join you today uh, to have this conversation. Um, we are gonna treat it as a conversation. We all three know each other very well. Um, so hopefully this is a little bit of a peek into a shared living room, as they might say, <laughs> una sala. Um, and you're getting to experience us uh, joking back and forth, but uh, hopefully um, sharing some insights Uh, learning from each other and, and talking about the journeys of these two magnificent uh, people that I get to uh, work with every day. Uh, and truly, truly, I mean this, it is an incredible blessing uh, on both counts. So thank you both every day for the partnership. Thank uh, you. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, I'm going to actually read their bios because they are so impressive that you deserve to hear all the detail. Um, and I also like to embarrass them a little bit. So why not? Okay. Um, so we're going to start with Osnad Shur. Uh, she is the producer uh, of the upcoming film, Raya and the Last Dragon, um, from Walt Disney Animation Studios. As you heard uh, Jimena mention uh, previously, uh, she produced the 2016 Academy Award nominated Moana. Huge fan. Uh, Shur joined Walt Disney Animation Studios in 2012 as Vice President of Development, working with filmmakers to move features and shorts through the creative process. As producer of Moana, Schurer helped manage the film through story, script, music, and casting, and led the film's partnership with publicity, marketing, and consumer products. Uh, she also created the film's Oceanic Story Trust, a team of Pacific Islander consultants from the islands with whom production collaborated closely through the making of Moana. Um, 
And we're going to talk a little bit about that later because it's an incredible process uh, and one uh, that's uh, continued on many of our films, including Raya. Uh, previously, uh, she served uh, as executive producer on the shorts uh, of the shorts group at Pixar Animation Studios, responsible for Pixar's short films. Uh, while there, she produced or executive produced uh, executive produced a host of hit shorts, including the Oscar-nominated *Lifted*, *One Man Band*, and *Boundin*. Her credits at Pixar also include video shorts like *Jack Jack Attack* and *The Adventures of Mr. Incredible*. Um, uh, at Pixar, Sher was also responsible uh, for helping to create several cutting edge multimedia shows, including MoMA's impressive Pixar 20 Years of Animation, which opened in 2006 and went on to travel the world. The exhibit featured Artscape, a widescreen uh, projection space that provided viewers a unique digital artistic experience and Zoetrope, a dynamic 3D installation modeled on pre-cinema technology and used dimensional character sculptures to simulate continuous motion. Oh, it's not, I did not know that. That is amazing. You are going um, so deep. I love this, Julianne. So like, I haven't talked about the Zoetrope since that night at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, that new gorgeous building, when uh, we're testing the Zoetrope, right? And um, the guard came in and went, he was looking at the little green men going up and down, and he kept going under it, looking to where did they go? And we knew that it worked. I remember that. But you guys... You're bringing, taking me down memory lane. That's great. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. Like what an incredible experience. And, and it's just to witness that in real time. So cool. Um, we're all geeking with you, uh, Oh, it's not right now. This is amazing. Um, your duties, of, I'm going deep. Your duties at Pixar also included training, production management, creating and supervising in-house documentary work for DVD bonus material content and other archival materials. You also oversaw the development of commercials, theme park attractions, uh, for The Incredibles, uh, The Incredibles, everybody, you produced and directed uh, Vowelette, an essay by Sarah Vowell. Is that, am I pronouncing that correctly? You are, but you are going so deep. I know. And then the making of The Incredibles, <laughs> exploring the reef with Cousteau, with Jean Michael Cousteau for director Andrew Stanton in conjunction with the release of Finding Nemo. Yep. We're going really deep. Like that was so fun. That was a shoot in Hawaii. Yep. Oh, amazing. So documentary, multimedia, animation, uh, you were the consulting producer on the Golden Globe nominated feature Arthur Christmas. And then prior to joining Pixar, Osnot produced and directed film and television in various mediums, uh, which we're gonna talk a little bit about that today as well. Live action, animation, live television, uh, what we just talked about in interactive. Um, and you worked on documentaries and narrative films all over the world, India, China, Tibet, Japan. Uh, Europe, across all of Africa and Europe, and with directors ranging from Michelangelo Antony to Alfonso Cuaron, uh, a name familiar uh, very much in Mexico. Um, Shura was born uh, in Israel as the child of an airline executive. I did not know that. And you grew up in many parts of the world, and you are an NYU, New York University grad. Uh, so with that, just a, I'm not going to be able to hear it, but a round of applause for o Oznan Shura. Amazing. Did you? provide all of this information or, or I have no idea where she dug it all up but this is I am terrified to hear what you're about to say yeah that's amazing Ozna. we went deep we went yeah. deep Ozna, that's amazing I did not even know half that we're gonna talk this is gonna go in a whole other some other layers here for our filmmakers in the audience wow um and with that whoo Carlos here we go uh Carlos <laughs> Lopez Estrada don't look what I dug up here's what we dug up uh, director Carlos Lopez Estrada uh, is director with Don Hall of the upcoming Walt Disney Animation Studios fantasy action film, Raya and the Last Dragon, which we're going to talk about today, which is, uh, is set uh, to release March 12th, 2021. Um, having joined Walt Disney Animation Studios in late uh, spring 2019, uh, you are a member of the Studio Story Trust. Uh, in addition to Raya and the Last Dragon, um, uh, Carlos also has another film in development. Uh, Lopez Estrada's debut film, Blind Spotting, huge fan, uh, premiered opening night at Sundance 2018 and was subsequently sold to Lionsgate uh, for a theatrical release. The film was produced uh, by Snoot Entertainment and stars David Diggs. Uh, Lopez Estrada was selected for Variety's 10 Directors to Watch for the 2018 list. And uh, it looks like, Carlos, you were also nominated by the Directors Guild of America for Outstanding Directorial Achievement for a first-time feature film director of 2018. His second film, Summertime, uh, premiered opening night of Sandown's 2020 
and will be released next year. And we're actually gonna go a bit deeper into that film today as it's screening uh, as part of the festival. Uh, on the TV side, uh, you directed an episode of FX's Legion um, and have an original piece uh, in development at uh, UCP, uh, Uni uh, Universal Cable Productions. Uh, your prolific music video and commercial director. Okay, now we're going a little deep. Here we go. Uh, music video and commercial directing. You're a founding partner of the multidiscipline production studio Little Ugly. You won a Latin Grammy for an animated video that you directed for Jesse and Joy, which uh, established you as the youngest director to win a Latin Grammy to date. Everybody, let's just take that in for a second. Um, you've worked with musicians such as Billie Eilish. Father John Misty, Thundercat, Flying Lotus, Carly Rae Jepsen, Capital Cities, Clipping and Passion Pit, um, the list goes on. Uh, and you apparently currently live in Los Angeles, which I knew, but with a dog, Coos, and a large family of plants. Um, so everybody, a little round of applause for Carlos Lopez Estrada. Oh my gosh. I didn't know the half of that either. The two of you, this is extraordinary. Um, and a little embarrassing. <laughs> um, so with that, we'll get off your bios and maybe do a little bit of diving deep as we're talking to some filmmakers today, they're on their career, they're on their journey here at the festival. Um, you know, why, you know, just let's start at the very beginning. Um, you know, where did you grow up? What was your journey? And when did you know you wanted to be a filmmaker? Like, when did that calling happen? Maybe uh, Osnat, we'll start with you. Uh -huh. Um, I grew up, as you mentioned, as, as an airline kid all over the world. I'm Israeli. My parents were Israeli, fought in the freedom movement um, to, to free Israel from the British. Um, so from a long line, but we, I grew up all over the world. Um, spent some of my childhood in Turkey, some in Africa. Um, came back to Israel around 12, 13, and then um, finished high school, did my army service, and came here to go to film school. After hitting the road, actually a couple of years in between there, um, of sort of exploration. I think for me, everything I did was always centered around storytelling. Mm -hmm. There are moments that stand out for me. My father was an incredibly avid photographer and filmmaker. We had, uh, he had a Super 8 camera and we used to film together and then we'd come back and we were in Africa. So we were coming back from the Victoria Falls. We we're coming back from something stunning and we'd be recording sound and with the bathtub water running so that we'd have the sound of the and we'd made little made little titles you know with those little white letters on a black background so um I was doing that and I was in the dark room I was like eight nine and that was very close to my heart then I got into um theater and acting and then um later that led to wanting to be behind the camera but I think every aspect did that. I did some radio. Uh, that's how old I am. Um, I every aspect of what I did, and then getting into uh, documentary filmmaking, mm -hmm. had to do with. Um, and maybe it's because I moved around so much as a child. Mm -hmm. I moved from culture to culture, and I remember at a young age, becoming aware that culture is a lens. There are others. I know. I get on an airplane. And I go somewhere else, and there's a different lens. Like going to a very British school where we were supposed to behave like little ladies, and then going back to Israel where it's like somebody did something to you, you, you beat, you know, out of them, you beat them up. Uh, there's no little lady, and you're eight, and you're like, oh, oh, I see. This is perspective. Sent me on this uh, road of storytelling and culture, and where the two meet, and what they mean to each other, how we create culture through story, and how. Um, story ends up be being culture, they're interwoven, and that's still going on. That went on for me um, in documentaries, that went on for me in uh, doing live television, and it went on, and Moana certainly brought that to a focus in a way that um, I loved and enjoyed. And, um, and we can talk later about kind of the move from, in from the indie world to the sort of Pixar Disney world, because it's very interesting what happens with opportunities it creates. Um, and it's still, it's still interesting to me. Ryan, The Last Dragon, again, um, looks at, it's a fantasy story where we're always looking for the balance that, of, of inspiration um, that comes from the culture and yet creating a new culture. We're creating a new story, something original. 
So I think that's an area of exciting um, curiosity and work for me. And I think filmmaking gives you a unique opportunity to do that with music and 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 picture and story and 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 words and it brings everything together that I love. Love that. Um, it, I, it's beautiful, Carlos. Yeah, you're jumping. No, in. I was just gonna say I I I didn't know so many of these things about you, was not, and that I, I uh, there's a lot of parallels with with sort of like my upbringing. Uh, I mean, your story is incredible, but but there was definitely a lot of like early uh, super eight moments for me and my mom giving me sort of like my fir first camera when I was very very young and me traveling with her sort of like learning uh about the world through her lens so I I uh I didn't know any any of this about you. it's amazing I was gonna guess that you're you growing up already had digital cameras super eight feels like from my <laughs> age well, I'm so thrilled that your mother had that not yet I I I was, I think, part of like the the transition. Like, I, I definitely still shot in like really, really um, old school cameras, and then as I got into um, like high school and college, slowly started becoming a part of the digital revolution. What made um, you want to tell? What made you want to be a filmmaker? Um, I was born in Mexico City, and I was. I was raised in this family that was like very dedicated to the arts, uh, communication and the arts. My, mm. my grandma was a theater actor. My grandpa was a journalist and he, he covered um, arts and entertainment. That's how they met. And both my parents met in a television studio, in a big television studio in Mexico City. So they, I, I was raised in this family that, um, after school, I would go to work with my mom, and then at night we would go see my my grandma at a play that she was in. Uh, I would spend the weekends with her, and sitting backstage sometimes. And then my mom was also doing some theater, so she got to travel a lot. Um, and I would travel with them when you know whenever summers and and uh, like holiday vacation. So I would I would bring this little camera that she had for me, and would just. Uh, mm -hmm. film everything that that um, that I considered sort of like interesting or unique important that eventually uh, I was in school so I started bringing my friends along and we would start making little movies and we would uh, recreate scenes uh, from Titanic was the big movie back in the day so uh, not n none of the none of the of the adult content in Titanic, just like the, it was mostly the action. Like we had a little boat and we would you know, put it in a pool or a lake and then recreate some of like the action moments. Uh, so that, that, I mean, that was before I even considered what a career in, in film could potentially be. I was just so young and I think just excited about getting together with friends and having a tiny little community where you can do stuff and save it forever. Uh, so so that I think that was just sort of like innate in who I was as a person. And then we moved to the States when I was 12. I did high school in Miami. And I think what when when I when I started doing high school and I started to just think a little bit more about my future and started taking classes that excited me and uh, thinking where potentially I could go to college. I started getting really into art and I did photography. I did a lot of painting classes. I did theater. Uh, and when it finally came down to start applying to colleges, I realized that film, not only was it something that I had been sort of like practicing for a long, long time and learning about it through uh, my family, but it also, it was the one discipline that would allow me to uh, explore all of these different interests that I had. So it, you know, there's, there's mm -hmm. a lot of theater in film. There's a lot of photography in film. There's a lot of music uh, in film. And, and, and there's also not a lot of math and other academic <laughs> stuff that I didn't like. So I applied to film school. I came here to California, I went to Chapman University and I guess also something that I did in high, in high school was that I played music with a, a, a lot of bands. So when I was in 
when I was starting film school, a lot of my friends who I had been playing with, the ones that stuck to music were starting to get like uh, working for indie labels or getting uh, their stuff sort of like, they start getting bigger opportunities in their mu young music careers uh, and getting like tiny budgets to do music videos. And that is sort of like how I started working. Mm -hmm. I would start working for my friends who, who didn't have a lot of money, but uh, wanted something, you know, semi-professional looking. So, and so mm -hmm. they would come to me and my friends who we, we didn't have a lot of experience and we didn't have, um, you know, much of a reel to show, but we, I was in a film school and we had access to equipment and they would let us use sometimes their stage. So it, it was a, it was a good exchange where we would mutually beneficial like they didn't have a lot of money we didn't have a lot of experience let's get together and do something uh and that sort of like slowly started as their career is starting you know they would get bigger budgets or they would get signed by better labels we would also just get more experience and uh start figuring out how to make things look better and make more sense uh so our 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 both of our careers uh, my musician friends and my filmmaking friends uh, started growing at the same time and then they started sort of like um, we would help them out make better videos they would help us out get better uh, opportunities with music and exposure and that essentially just like snowballed into commercials uh, I did a few shorts I did a few digital things and long story short that led to my first feature um, David, who wrote and starred in it with Rafael Casal. Uh, I had done music videos for them. I met them. I did a music video for David for a thousand dollars. And and his rap group started to do really well. Uh, then anyway, we'll talk about our, our first, our first project film, nice. but, but, but that just sort of like snowballed and then uh, here I am. <laughs> Amazing. Well, with that, we should just snowball into that piece of the puzzle right you were just kind of getting there in terms of yeah what was that break sure. what was that transition uh in the journey and uh and then and i love both of you as you think about what was that flip moment for you right what was that break then maybe reflecting off of that what's been the transition also we have a lot of independent filmmakers in the audience what's that transition or, or things you wish you would have known um between sort of the independent world and then working, you know, in a larger studio or, you know, with, a, you know, larger projects and, and sort of what you learn, because goodness, uh, there's a lot there, so. We were just yeah. talking about it and I think, Osna, you're gonna have an amazing story and mine is gonna be, it, it's still happening, it's still unfolding, so I'll, I'll. Uh, He's deferred I'll, to age. This is a nice way of saying I'll defer no, to No, 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 I'm, I'm refer yeah. referring to experience. <laughs> Uh, do you um, want to go first? Yeah. yeah. No, I'm I'm happy to. I think I have a, a few examples, and I think first of all, I'll talk about what struck me because when I um, I've done a lot of different things in my career, as as mentioned, I'm quite old, um, and I've done um, more independent, and then some things that were a little bit less so, but they were still when I say less so, it was a museum um, or National Geographic or something like that, and so for me, Pixar and also it was my move into animation, was it the true first experience of going mainstream. And what do I mean by going mainstream is a few things. You'll recognize these, anybody who's a filmmaker, right? Um, one, I suddenly moved from, well, I can promise you a bagel to, hey, I can pay you and here's a credit. And that is a big difference in you know, finding everything, past career, license, music, whatever. Um, and that was really nice. That's really nice when you can offer people their true value. And um, the other though, the one that struck me the most is the first thing that for me that just for some reason struck home is I joined Pixar and we were towards the end of Finding Nemo and um, Andrew said, listen, I, no offense to these wonderful, you know, electronic press kits that are often a recreation. I want a true documentary. Um, and I said, great, you're, you're talking my language. I come from documentaries, but it means there will be a camera in the room. 
like it's inconvenient. <laughs> we'll own the footage, but um, and he said, do it. Let's just do it. He really wanted, um, really wanted it to be alive. And then we pitched these other ideas. Like I was like, can we do something for the reef? You know, uh, you're in the reef. I know I'm coming from the nonprofit world, which is another big part of my career. But um, and so we pitched this idea. Everybody loved it. It was to work with Jean Michel Cousteau, um, and he's trying to make a documentary. And he was so game. He's trying to make a documentary. And Dory and our characters are like, what do you mean the Spanish? You mean Bob over there? Like they're disrupting the doc for the DVD. And uh, we ended up doing it. And I did a math that was the most conservative I could be of how many people saw it. 25 million DVDs of, of Finding Nemo sold into individual households. That's insane. And it's just like I went 20 years of documentaries, this little piece with like, I licensed underwater footage. We didn't even go shoot it or, or recreate it in animation, you know what I mean? But it meant so much. And it ended just with the website, you know, because the kids can go learn about the ocean and, and how you can, how just not putting junk in it is going to help revive um, the reef. So that was a big aha moment for me, you know? And then after that, like characters that you've thought about coming to life the whole thing of Moana catching, having a life of her own. I mean, so many stories of, of, of how that impacted. Um, I, also, um, I also think that every story is worth telling. How many people see it is going to be the different opportunity that you have, but just the very expressing of some of our, of our stories when we start out telling stories mm -hmm. is enough of a goal in itself that um, if you do that with enough focus and talent, uh, like Carlos telling stories in the, in the capacity that he could, it, 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 it kind of helps shift you into a bigger and bigger um, audience or a more and more specific audience for you. So I'd say it's an organic process mostly. That would be my recommendation to most filmmakers. It's worth it because, um, especially for all you young people out there. Um, it's worth it because you can affect the world with your stories. And so tell them. Yeah. I, I feel similarly. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that it's, it's amazing to hear you talk about it because I'm still, as I mentioned, still very much a part, that's the transition that I'm experiencing right now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think the philosophy behind it is the same, obviously very different stories and backgrounds but the philosophy behind it is the same uh for for me my my transition sort of like from hyper independent into the slightly more commercial world was when i made my first movie which wasn't that long ago i think we shot it maybe like three and a half years ago um but i as i was mentioning earlier uh I had done music videos mostly, and these were like low budget music videos that eventually became not so lo low budget, uh, but still like compared to most of the production that exists in the world, they, we were still doing it for pennies and asking, you know, my friends would all crew in it. Most times my friends would star in it. We would shoot it in our houses or in, you know, uh, businesses that you know my dentist's office or it, 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 it was like that kind of independent mm -hmm. um, and then eventually you know we were able to start shooting with nicer cameras and shooting in, in smaller studios but still it was very much like the music video industry especially now uh, and when I was starting to do it it, I, it really wasn't this glamorous thing where you were shooting in like private jets and like closed down games some people got to do it, but friends and I didn't. We were, yeah, we were shooting around LA with cameras running around. Um, and I'm glad it was like that because I think it very much shaped the way my creative brain works. Um, but I did this video for uh, David's group called Clipping. He has like a, a, a hip hop group. It's him and three more people, two more people. Um, we did it for a thousand dollars. We uh, asked for every imaginable uh, favor, but I did it because I heard the music and I remember hearing David's voice and David's uh, 
um, words and I just thought that this was a brilliant man mm -hmm. and a brilliant set of, of minds behind this uh, and I was like I don't know what what's gonna happen with this but it's worth my time and I can tell that something tells me that David has a, a, a lot to say um, and we did this video then I became good friends with David and the guys from Clipping we ended up doing maybe like 10 or 11 music videos together uh, that I actually really like and I, those guys are brilliant um, and then David got called to New York to do a reading for this musical called Hamilton and he kind of like explained it to me and I was like I remember that part <laughs> yeah I was like sounds, inter sounds interesting I think we had to push maybe a music video shoot because he was leaving to New York for a few weeks to do this thing uh, and then a few weeks turned into a few months, <laughs> turned into you know years and the world changing forever. Uh, so he he was part of the original cast of Hamilton, and so good in it. I just have yeah, to he was incredible. So good, that what did I miss moment? Oh my god! Yeah, he he was incredible, <laughs> and I'm so glad mm. that you know the world witnessed it because I think he deserves all the recognition that has come his way um but I happened to move to New York around the same time that he did uh and it was just by by chance because I've always wanted to move to New York and I had a chance where uh, my lease in LA ended so I moved to New York and he was there so we continued working when he was there he introduced me to Rafa who was his co-writer in, in um, blind spotting and essentially what happened is the day that David left Hamilton, so he did his run and then he prepared to, you know, do new things. Uh, these, this group of producers who had been talking to him for years about this particular script came to him and said, if you have time, we think that we can help you do it. We can finance it and we can uh, produce this movie for you. And because I had a relationship with him and Rafa and we had been working together for years on some theater projects and musical projects and blind spotting had so much of those two things uh they essentially just invited me to join the project and it was very very sudden like hey what are you doing uh you know next few months uh we we need to we have this script that is like seven years old but we want to workshop it uh with you can you come to LA can we work on it together and potentially we, we can shoot it in the summer uh so anyway, long story short, I moved to LA. We workshopped the the script together. We shot it that summer. Uh, that was 2017, and then it um, it, it was in, we had a budget and we had finance, but it was still like a a, a fairly independent project. Uh, and then premiered at Sundance the next year, and it just kind of changed my life. I mean, there's a direct connection to, to here being here at Disney because. Jessica Julius, who is the head of development of Disney Animation, was at Sundance when it premiered. She saw it. And around that same time, uh, Jennifer Lee, who is or the chief creative officer at Disney Animation right now, had just started on her new position and had said that one of the first things that she wanted to do was to bring in some uh, outside voices to join the directing team at Disney Animation. So right at that time, it was just lucky timing but right at that time uh jessica had seen my movie at sundance uh jen had started looking for you know new new uh voices in in animation and they invited me to come for a coffee we had a nice chat they figured out that i was a you know lifelong we decided he was a keeper <laughs> yeah. they i had a i showed up to my meeting with a mickey mouse backpack not not purposely, just because that was my backpack. Uh, and I, we, we just clicked. And anyway, long story short, I I joined the studio a few, uh, like a year and a half, a little bit less than two years ago. Uh, and that was it. That's an incredible, Carlos. And also the detail of the Mickey backpack to the meeting <laughs> is really- It was- really something. Yeah, no, no, I, it really, they called me back later and I had to come in to meet all the directors. And I mean, I, it was my 
backpack. So I showed up with my backpack and I, I had to go into the meeting and just say like, I want you all to know that I did not buy this for the meeting and I'm not trying to, you know. It's so Carlos to both come with the backpack and then disclaim it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Exactly. I, I just did, yeah. You know. Anyway, it worked. Yeah, yeah it worked so we got to keep them. Yeah, no, and the rest is history, as they say, in a way, uh, which we're going to get into a little bit of that present history. Um, in a small promo for those of you who are in the audience who are independent filmmakers and you're thinking, how can I get seen at Disney? What are the opportunities to connect the dots? A little bit of what, in, in a way, of what Carlo's journey was, but in a some from a slightly different modality, um, but in the short film space, we have Launchpad, which is a shorts incubator um, that my team works on. Uh, in partnership with Osnat Carlos and many other creatives at the studios. Thanks for the snaps. Uh, and uh, if you're interested and you want to learn more, it's launchpad.disney.com. Really straightforward, launchpad.disney.com. And we can make sure you all get that website link. Um, but we will uh, we will be uh, opening up the next application period uh, in 2021. So really want to hear from you all. Um, and when can, may I? May I just, I just want to say a word here about- To talk about you for the next- oh, okay. For a second, because <laughs> like, I'm a huge fan and Julianne has been working in this space of inclusion and of, of making sure the voices are diverse in many mediums for a very, very long time and very, very successfully. But the magical thing she does is she makes it fun. So- just saying, big shout out to you, Julia. You're amazing. No, I I will second that. And even though my my time at Disney has been short, uh, you have become one of the people that I get to interact with the most. And I actually love it because every single time, every single project, every single conversation that we have, it feels like you find the ways to make them meaningful and to make them impactful. And it's to know that a company as big as Disney has a person as incredible as you uh, spearheading all of these initiatives, I think is, is really special. Uh, I, I know that OSNET has been directly involved with Launchpad in this first, yeah. in this first iteration. Uh, and I, I've only, I've met a lot of people who have been, but I can't wait to, you know, be, more involved in the future, as involved as you let me. Uh, but I know that the, everyone who's who's uh, been in, in, involved with the project is just so inspired by just it all the voices so, that come like, out of it. Yeah, I don't know. Do you, can we talk so, about it, or is it? Yeah, yeah I, well, we can say. I mean, there's there's stuff. Yeah, check it out on the website. There is. Uh, okay. It's an amazing program that keeps in mind finding, creating, nurturing, helping. Um, voices, storytellers with the Disney uh, resources behind making people successful. Now that's cool. That is like just definition of cool. So, yeah. And it's thank you both. Gosh, oh my, thank you. You're making me. Woo. Uh, and uh, Carlos, we've now recorded you saying that you want to be involved in the next season of Launchpad. So this is great. I have it in, uh, look at this, it's in video. I already, I, I was already scheming because you are working now with someone who I've worked with before in the music video days and, and this person is helping you and your team. So I've already sent an email just being like, hey, please keep me in mind when you do this next thing. There we go. Um, I believe you're in a, in a presentation somewhere. Your photo has already appeared. Oh, really? Oh, oh, see, walk by uh, too slowly. Uh, Okay, yeah. well, it'll happen then. Um, so it's amazing. I want to shout out to Osnat for all her mentorship work on the program in this first iteration. Um, it's been really wonderful to see the voices. Really encourage all of you, throw your hat in the ring. As Osnat said, it's all about developing and nurturing storytellers who have something to say. And as you were saying, Osnat, every story is valid. And so it becomes about how are we helping to resource and showcase your story and your talents uh, to uh, to the world, really. So um, really exciting. Again, 2021, be on the lookout uh, for launchpad.disney.com. I always feel like an infomercial when I give the website. It's Everybody, good. I have a commercial. Uh, <laughs> um, but with that, um, and thank you both so much uh, for your encouragement, your support, uh, and your mentorship. 
I, I want to uh, flip us a little bit uh, into another part of the conversation. Um, we talked a bit about blind, blind spotting Carlos, um, but you do have another uh, project coming up, uh, and it's uh, and it's a part of this festival with uh, summertime. And I, you want to tell a little bit about it, and I think we have a clip to share. So I'd love you to talk a little yeah. bit about that and maybe set up the clip. Um, th it's 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 kind of crazy that these two projects came together because I'm I was. I was transitioning out of, of doing this project when I started working at Disney. So it was really sort of like the biggest contrast you could ever imagine in terms of like a true, true independent movie that we did for with very, very little resources and a lot of heart to uh, a Disney movie that also has a lot of heart, but we did it with a lot of resources and a great, incredible team of, you know, like 900 plus people. Um, and that, really did happen overnight so it's 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 crazy to be talking about these two things simultaneously uh summertime began as a collaboration between uh myself and my sort of like team that i had been doing a lot of music videos and commercials with and a nonprofit here from la they're called get lit they essentially um work with young spoken word poets and and uh, through high school and into college, provide all of these different programs that are meant to increase increase uh, literacy and bring bring their curriculum of spoken word to their individual schools and um, bring their instructors into the program so they can allow to they can teach the the curriculum uh, as a part. They they're essentially now partnered up with like many, many, many LA district schools uh, and essentially just started like this empire of, of like young spoken word poets. And I, they invited me to one of their showcases last year, early last year, uh, 2019. And it was essentially just like two hours of back-to-back -back, uh, spoken word poetry. These young artists that were all, most of them were still in high school at that time just got to share a little bit of their perspective of what it's like to be young living in the city of LA and their very, very particular sort of like experience. And I remember just being so moved and, and so inspired by this very diverse group of people that was speaking like so beautifully about their experience and that was using, you know, whatever was unique and special and different about them to create it and turn it into art and then wanting to share it with as many people as possible. So essentially I, I came back uh, from that, that showcase and I told the director of the organization who I had a relationship with, I told her, look, I, I don't know how exactly I could be helpful or I don't know exactly what kind of project we can do, but I, what I saw was very, very impactful and it really did move me in a way that nothing else has. Uh, and if I could be helpful, I know that you do a lot of performances. I don't know if this is like a theater piece or if we do like a show or like, I'm not sure what exactly this could be, but I would love to try to brainstorm some ways for us to, to work together. Um, and then I just, it just kept, I kept in the back of my mind and I kept sort of thinking like, what could we potentially do? And then the idea of making it an, very, very low budget independent film popped into my head. And I had seen a, a movie particularly called Slacker that was done uh, in the in the 90s by, by Richard Linklater. Um, it's essentially a day in the life of Houston and, and uh, no, not Houston, Austin, sorry. Austin's youth. And it essentially just follows different conversations that happen between different people and it you you get to follow like two people having a conversation and then you get to stick with one of them as they go into the next interaction throughout the day and then you you're introduced to a new set of people and then so on and so forth so if i i i pitched to them the idea of like what if we did our version of slacker in la and it essentially every poet got to write and perform their own piece uh 
which essentially what I had seen at that showcase. And then we worked together there as a group, uh, putting like creating all the 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 connections, the connective tissue between story A and story B, and essentially through it tell the story of a day in the life of Los Angeles and see it through their eyes. So that was a really long-winded way of saying uh, this movie is essentially a collection of uh, poetry and a collection of 25 different stories that all take place over one day in uh, Los Angeles in 2019. So uh, that being said, I think we're going to show a clip. Uh, and this is a poem that uh, to uh, a poet call a, a poet by the name of Amaya and a poem by the name of uh, Benet worked on it together and they were just trying to share their perspective on what home means to them, the concept of home. Home is apartment 12, 21 stairs, two locked knobs, and one slam door cul-de-sac off Central Avenue. Three turns, two speed bumps, and one stop sign. Home is... Burgundy wine, chocolate couches, and peeling paint. My bed, hidden holiness under the sheets, resurrecting sleep, waking to the sound of the dryer and dishwasher. Fireworks. Triggered car alarm sirens. Home is... Missed curfews and mahogany curtains. My father snoring lullabies. My mama, in every room of the house. How I'll miss the 4 a.m. tick of her footsteps. Home is... The only salon I know in this city closing soon. Slim fingers parting my curls. Massaging heaven in my scalp. And braiding me armor every morning. Home is fridge magnets, fresh cut grass, cinnamon candles. My brother's cheap weeds smoked behind Lysol and lavender incense. Home is Crenshaw, Baldwin, Whole Food shoppers shopping property on Slauson, barbecue pop-ups, Mima's hot water cornbread. The Elote Man, the burger spot, and the same little torta truck. Cracked alleyways and yoga mats, roadblocks and barbershops, no hot water or parking spots. It's a work in progress, a practice in patience, gratitude and grief. Home is my timeline on display in the hallway. I am eight. By the living room, I culminate. Diploma in a frame. Home is a dollhouse outgrown. Playground sand slipping through my fingers. Faded door frame height, Goodwill bags, toy box, spotted walls, burst tooth, old habits, lost keys, home is how the saying goes, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And after years of collecting reasons to leave, the, the door, door is wide, wide open, open, but I can't decide what shoes to wear when, when I walk, walk out. There wow. it is. That is beautiful. Yeah. So, <laughs> it, yeah, it gets me every time. Uh, so th this is um, this is a, a very particular piece, but it follows it follows this kind of structure where um, you know one of these two characters, and eventually th this is like a slightly more dreamy piece, a slightly more abstract piece, but. Uh, you essentially do follow characters like going as they go into the metro, as they go into their therapy session, as they go into work, as they meet their family, and that's sort of the the, the structure of the piece. And it's very unconventional, but uh, I'm actually very happy with how it turned out. And the the group, the community that we got to work with of young artists, is really incredible. Um, they've actually been coming into to Disney Animation to talk a little bit with the, the project that I'm developing next and uh, just sharing a little bit of their poetry. And it, it's the, the way all these wor worlds uh, intersect is, is pretty exciting. That's all I have to say. Mm -hmm. Stay mm -hmm.
It's amazing, Carlos. I'm still moved by the piece. So I'm just oh, thank you. I I will send you a link to see the movie if you're in if, if you want. Hundred percent. It's done. Yeah. Yeah, it's done. Yeah. Yeah, it's done. Uh, we we uh, premiered it earlier this year. And then of course all the uh, pandemic uh, surprises happened. So we're gonna release it next year. Uh, in the in the summer and uh, see see how it goes. There you go. Summertime in the summer. Uh, <laughs> it's beautiful, beautiful mixture of, of so much of your own spirit in there between the the music and the image intersecting and the words. It was it's, it's really beautiful rhythmic work. Um, oh, I was just thank you. Really taken by it. Um, I'm also a huge spoken word fan, so I have a complete bias toward anything. That oh, I don't know. Did. Yeah. Um, I'm send both you and us not uh, a link when we're done with it. Yes, us not. We got a link out of the panel. This I is know. We're done here. <laughs> our work here is done. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and with that, we're going to turn it actually back to us not because um, I, you know, Carlos just shared a bit about summertime, which is upcoming project. Um, but you did some tremendous work uh, that has inspired, and this is where I will say it has inspired my team and myself on the daily, but so many others, uh, both in the industry and in our company, around Moana uh, with the Oceanic uh, Story Trust and uh, the care and consideration and partnership um, and impact that came both into that and out of it. Um, I, I'd love you to talk a little bit about that work, um, why it's so important. And you reflected a bit at the beginning when you talked about culture. Um, and then, uh, and then maybe tying that into a little bit of uh, Raya and the Last Dragon. Sure, I'd be happy to. It's a topic you can't even, you know, you have to stop me at some point. Um, I think for me, the moment, well, I, like I said, I've, I've moved around cultures my whole life, and then have I come from a place that's the crux of cultures, and when we're we identify in Israel with Africa, Asia, or Europe, depending on whether, you know, if it's football or something we can win. Um, <laughs> but um, when I got on Moana and um, as, as the head of development, uh, Ron and John, first of all, I got to work with some of the gods of animation. We're talking about Ron Clements and John Musker. We're talking about, you know, Little Mermaid, Aladdin, Hercules, anybody? So, um, that was incredible, especially um, since it was um, my first musical and they're just experts at that. There's a whole thing to talk about there, but um, there had been one research trip. Um, then we started our first writer on the film um, was a Pacific Islander, uh, Taika Waititi, who's since done a thing or two that people have heard of, bless him. Um, Thor, anybody? Um, Jojo Rabbit. But he, he was, um, we had, uh, reached out to him because of a couple of his independent films that we loved so much, like Boy. Anyway, so we were working with a number of people from the region, but one of the things that became very, very clear early on is that um, to really connect with a culture so that it's, um, it, it infuses the work that you do. We're making a work of the imagination, of course. I mean, it comes from the imaginations like Ron and John and Taika and uh, many amazing people that we had on the movie, but that it, it has the soul, you know, the soul of the movie carries some of the inspiration from a culture. Um, you need to continue working together. It's not a matter of just going somewhere, getting some research done and coming back, not just because you don't know everything as an expert, far from knowing everything, but also because it's an ongoing conversation. It's not something that you get and then you've got it. It happens in every change. It happens in, you know, I've talked about it. It's kind of an inconvenient truth a lot of times. You're, you're, you're finally cracked this great joke right in the story where we need it to be funny. But guess what? It, um, it doesn't work for some reason that somebody wasn't aware of. Um, in my case, I'll often be a question of, of how, we, how, how we work with our with our female um, characters. In this case, it had so much to do with that gorgeous, deep culture and history that we met when we met, went to the islands. And the love and the warmth of the people and the, uh, you can't separate it. It, it comes with the, um, the traditions that infuse the culture. And so we went on a research trip and when we came back, we designed what uh, an additional research trip it was also where um, 
we got to put our musical team together for the first time. So again, it was Lynn manuel Miranda. Yeah, the guy who said he's working on a hip hop musical about the founding fathers at the at the public. And I said, oh, we'll have him in two months full time, right? That guy, um, Lynn manuel Miranda. Obataya Fua'i, who um, was born and raised in Samoa, moved to New Zealand at a teenage to, to go to better schools. Parents are from Tokelau, Tuvalu Islands with thousand people in you know, very, very small uh, Pacific Island communities and Mark Machine had helped pull it together. So we were in New Zealand and there we were meeting with our ethnomusicologist as well. There we were um, at a festival that represented the music from all the islands. Each place we went, we worked with these amazing people that would work really hard in development to try and identify. There, there's a quality of both expertise and immersion in the culture. Um, as well as an understanding of how that can um, translate into a Disney animated movie, which um, by definition is designed to appeal to uh, two to 92 all over the world <laughs> to, to find common language. So how do you work with finding the specificity that leads to a universal experience, you know, um, that doesn't alienate, that actually includes. And so we created this trust. We called them the Oceanic Story Trust. Um, the key players in it were an anthropologist who stayed with us. Every image went to her before it went um, for legal clearance from, from Samoa, Dr. Dion Fanati. We had an incredible consultant from uh, Tahiti who is both um, somebody who's working to preserve the Tahitian language and culture in a nonprofit she founded and works for Berkeley University there and in and, and a field station. So it was that ability people who were interested in how that translation would work. And we met with our trust, depending on what we needed, um, with the master tattooist for approval on every Maui tattoo and how they move with, we had a, a group um, in the small village um, called Korova in Fiji. They are, um, they, they don't even have electricity in, that, on, on, in their land. And yet there are people who are very happy. This just, filled with this incredible richness to share with us and they still navigate in the old ways. And so we were able to help bring them over to the university and Skype with them. It was all generations, everybody came to understand how those ropes worked that we had designed on the boat that was built off of their knowledge and expertise. So it was an ongoing thing through animation, through, um, through products then, through parks, through publishing. And we were also lucky enough to be able to um, hire somebody on the show, um, Kelly Coverly, who um, is our community relations manager. And she joined us on the show, she's also native Hawaiian, so also carries a lot of that knowledge. Joined us on the show to really help make sure that we're always giving attention to the culture in terms of the respect that we're paying. And there were, people were there to do that. They were in the room. Opataya was the one in, uh, in uh, a note session um, after screening, because our system, by the way, is that we, we finish a script, we board the whole thing, we screen it, and then we tear it apart together so that we can put it together better. It's a crazy system, but it works. And we were in one of these sessions and, and thinking about how we wanted to honor more all of these incredible things we've learned about the culture and the tapa cloth and the coconut in this place. And, and he just went, I've got it. He jumped up and I got it. We should do a song. That is what we can do. We can do a song there. And that became the village song, the consider the coconut, that one. Um, so that we could just take a moment to celebrate a culture. And the reason we were struggling with it till then is that because Moana has to go out and help this world and we can't make that world as appealing as we wanted to. So we we're struggling with it story-wise and found a way to incorporate it. So I'm full of stories like that, but the, Bottom line was to find a way to have a continued collaboration, to commit together all the filmmakers to listen and hear and know how to incorporate that and not let that um, ever feel like something that's getting in the way of creativity, but it's something that encourages more creativity because we just have another boundary we have to consider, you know, just like a lake has boundaries. And um, how to, continue the conversation even when we finished the film, because um, that was very important to me. Um, a lot of these relationships became friendships. They continue to this day, um, allow me to travel again and I can go <laughs> visit my friends in Tahiti. 
Um, and one of our um, partners in Tahiti had this dream when we first talked to her five years before the movie came out that this Disney movie could be done in Tahitian. No movie ever had mm. been done in Tahitian because everyone speaks French. Less than 250,000 people were still speak the language and it's a, it's a living um, oral culture. When oral culture, when a language dies, a culture dies. And so I got all excited about that with given my background and between us and a lot of incredibly wonderful, generous people in Disney side and incredibly, incredibly generous and talented people in Tahitian side. The movie exists in Tahitian and it was shown all over the islands, never ever charged for. And hundreds of DVDs have gone into the schools and the kids can go back to learning their own language through a Disney movie. That kind of combination is thrilling to me. Cut to Raya and the Last Dragon and so much of the inspiration, it's a fantasy film. It's very much something created through the minds of these incredible storytellers and filmmakers. But it draws inspiration from the region of Southeast Asia. Um, it's a large region with multiple, multiple, multiple cultures and, and very unique cultures. There's some, there's some um, exciting through lines and threads and certainly the people we worked with in the places we visited, which included um, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, Singapore, Malaysia, um, and of course, Indonesia, um, particularly went back to Bali more than once. The people that we met, some of them became our, um, what we now call our Southeast Asian Story Trust. We have a visual anthropologist, a Lao visual anthropologist who works in the California um, uh, university system who's seen every single image and talks to us about, you know, how we can honor and respect the culture that inspires it more. Again, it's a fantasy, there's dragons, spoiler alert, it's, there's magic. Um, and yet um, every effort was taken by every one of the filmmakers and art directors and production designers and, and, and storytellers and animators to pay attention. We have a, a dancer from Bali who helped with movement and how you hold yourself in respect. And um, architect from Thailand who's helped us with the imagery and with what, what feels like a design principle underneath it. So it continues and um, for me, it can't, it's so exciting. It's hard. It's hard to maintain. It is. But it's really exciting thing to be part of. I mean, you know, you do so much of this kind of work. And it, it's, um, for me, the two things that are like real pillars is, is, is the cultural inspiration and the strength, the new, and maybe, sadly, but never before seen, I think, in each, in each round, strength of our female characters, nuanced, flawed, um, interesting, badass, you know, those two things, I hope dear to my heart. Love it. And uh, Osna, I see it every day. So it's so beautiful mm -hmm. to hear you articulate it because it's, it is, it's so true. And it's so core if you think about the, at the end of the day, the storytelling, as you said at the beginning, right? It's the culture and the story intersecting. And I believe you actually, you have a clip to share with us from Raya. Um, should we, um, should we go ahead and pop that up? Uh, take a look. Guardian of the Dragon Gem. But this world has changed. And its people are divided. Now, to 
restore peace. I must find the last dragon. My name is Raya. Getting a little too big for this, bud. Wow! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> That's our new trailer. It's so exciting. It's such an exciting film on for multiple reasons you just outlined, Osnat, in some of your thoughts and comments. Um, I'm so curious, actually, um, from from both of you. Um, maybe starting with Carlos, we'll go back to you, Osnat. Is you know, what excites you about this film, uh, you know, from story to character, whatever you want to talk about, what's, what really drew you to it? And also what's so exciting and continues every day you wake up and you're like, oh my gosh, that. Um, there's, there's really so much about it. Um, I think for me personally, I, I, there's, there's two levels, right? The first one is uh, uh, just on like a, professional and artistic uh, level, getting to work at Disney and getting to interact every single day with so many people that are so talented, so inspiring. Uh, a lot of people who work at animation were responsible for a lot of my biggest childhood memories and they're still there and you're still getting to talk and work and interact with them. And that is just um, it's sort of like a thing that I never imagined could be my life right now that I'm, I'm getting to see designs for ideas that I'm having with people on a group all of a sudden sort of like materialized into these beautiful pieces of art. Uh, that is incredible. And just in terms of, of the movie and the story, and I think that the the messages that we're trying to share with it, I, I it just feels like it just feels like a story that really does speak to many of the conversations that are happening today, many of the problems that are happening today. And it, it, it does so in such a creative, uh, like imaginative and really, really special way. So for me to, I think, just to try to tie both of the conversations that we're having together, um, to be able to have the same spirit that I think that exists in a movie like Summertime, the same heart, um, and to be able to, to see a group of 900 plus people working on something with just as much, as big of a heart and, and being mm. extra, extra thoughtful in every single detail and seeing how, you know, the smallest design or the smallest character element, the, the smallest story beat, uh, is really just trying to accomplish the, the same thing, which is just to create create a connection between uh, us telling the story, the people that are telling the story about it, and the people watching it. it it's kind of been uh, really special to me. Um, and the, the story, the way I describe it is uh, uh, a story about the power of unity, uh, the magic of unity of, you know, people coming together and, 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 and wanting to work together. Uh, and I could not think of a more relevant theme or more relevant idea to uh, just what we're experiencing today uh, in, in so many different ways. But even we thought the movie was relevant a year ago. And, and, then, and then all of a sudden, we had to work on this movie from our homes and we had to so somehow create this sense of community this sense of like partnership while each of us was so far away from each other mm -hmm. uh, so the, the movie just to me became relevant in more than a hundred ways uh and now we're about to present this this uh movie to the world that speaks about the power of unity in a time that i feel like could not be more uh, uh significant and could not mean more and it means a lot to us as a team it means a lot to the studio just as a community and hopefully people who watch it in march 12th uh feel similarly it, it's it's uh 
it's a story about people from very different backgrounds, from very different ideologies coming together and finding the common ground and understanding uh, how much they could accomplish if they see eye to eye and if, if they decide to um, work together. And it, it, it's just incredible that we can, I, I can, I can see the same sense of purpose in a tiny independent movie that we did for no money with non-actors uh, running around a camera with a camera in LA and then with this incredible production uh, that you know is going to travel the world and hopefully be seen by millions and millions of people. So anyway, that 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 is what excites me the most. Uh, so it's not, I don't know if you, yeah, I'm sure you I know. do. And, and I also, I can't wait um, until Carlos has that experience when you first, that first experience, Carlos, when you walk by and the child is holding like a Raya action figure. I want to be there because you're just going to burst out crying. It's just yeah. this incredible feeling of like, it has a life of its own. For me, it was the moment on Moana where my great niece in Israel, she looks a lot like Moana. She has the same kind of mocha colored skin, big cascade of curls. And she would pose in her Raya costume with, and in, her, in her Moana costume with her oar in the morning before going to school in a warrior pose. This was her doing her princess, but in a warrior pose. And I just burst, I just lost it. It was just like, yes, yes, this is so good. I guess for me, there are a lot of things that I'm excited about. I've been working on the film for, it'll be close to four years by the time the film comes out. And um, it's gone through many iterations, but always at its heart, it's had a really, really strong, interesting, unexpected, and I don't think we've seen her before, female protagonist and relationships. And when I say I don't think we've seen it before, it's because as you know, when you're working on a movie, you're looking at what are comps, what, what can excite, you know, what's interesting, what are shorthand for us as filmmakers? We're in the story room and we go, you know, the Indiana Jones of it all. And it means we want some really cool obstacles, you know, you can shorthand some things. There aren't yet enough films you can shorthand for any kind of interesting relationships between two female leads. This is a really, yes, you know, we've got sisters in Frozen, again, from animation. We've got Moana who, um, I can't tell you how many times I was asked why she doesn't have a, a love interest at the end. She's 16 and she has to save the world. Who's got time, people? So that idea of females as strong, full characters, in this case, the dragon, the magical creature is also a female and the antagonist who, let me tell you, is badass. I can't talk much about her yet, but just you wait till you see some of the martial arts between these two women, both really capable, both really strong, both with flaws in their thinking, but their heart is in the right place. So to me, that's super exciting. It shouldn't be groundbreaking, but let me tell you people, it still is. And then the, um, the what, what Carlos was touching on, we all have to set aside our differences to work for the greater good. It isn't a question anymore. It's just a question of when we'll wake up and do what we need to do. And that's what this film is about. And it takes some acts of trust that are really hard for us and they're hard for our characters. But guess what? Um, hopefully people will leave the theater going, we can do this because we have to. Amazing. I for one cannot wait and uh, I've had the privilege of seeing it a few times along the way, but I cannot wait to see the finished moment uh, in March of 21. And um, and Carlos, I think I think we're all going to have to be there when you see the the doll, the action figure, the costume, the girl in a costume mm -hmm. pose, like your great niece. Oh, I mean, is that's those are the moments. That's that's the beauty of what of what yeah. we all need. Um, we release the the trailer the first teaser trailer a few um a few months ago and we you know everyone on the crew was so excited because their work finally got to got to see the light of day and people were talking about it and we were sending back and forth all these reaction videos of, of people uh, watching the trailer for the first time particularly southeast asians particularly people uh from the community and just sharing sort of like their reactions of seeing people who look and act and feel like them uh, on on you know major animated feature 
Uh, and there's some really, really beautiful emotional moments uh, of people who are just like cannot contain themselves and are just so incredibly moved by what they're seeing. Just, just real reactions, sometimes wordless, just seeing their eyes full of tears and saying like, little girl saying like, that's me. We got a video from a, a, a mom filming her daughter uh, whose name is Raya seeing seeing the, this trailer and it's just just moments that i don't really think i would experience anywhere else and it's been so so meaningful i i can't yeah i can only imagine once we start uh hopefully we'll, we'll be able to travel soon and, and yeah, seeing these sure. movies and seeing just what this movie means to them yeah i it's it's yeah. been, it's Definitely. something that that's come up a lot. We have uh, there's a lot of key creatives on the movie are are, are of Southeast Asian origin. The, the two writers, the uh, Adele Lin is Malaysian, um, Kui Wen is Vietnamese. Our head of story, Fawn, grew up in Thailand. People talking about um, how that that feeling that you get when these when these great loves their love for Disney and, and their great love for the cultures that they come from, come together on the screen. Uh, Fawn, I think, described it as this incredible dream I didn't know I had. Mm. Yeah, we, there's, there's uh, so many people from the region that we're working with and even them who created so many of these pieces and came up with all these ideas, uh, whether it's music or the props or the, the the locations, mm. uh, they yeah they get to see some of these because we're we're right now we're about to finish the movie and we're getting to see the shots finalized like with lighting and sound and music uh, and all these people who are very very close to it uh, see it and they have this emotional reaction of just saying I have never seen my culture represented in this way uh, so beautifully and it, that is so so meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't think of a better note to end on uh, in terms of our conversation today uh, with this amazing uh, Guadalajara um, Film Festival. Um, I wanna just thank both of you, Osna, Carlos, uh, for your amazing thoughts, reflections, advice um, for the filmmakers who are with us, um, excitement and joy for the upcoming pictures, summertime screening and Raya mm -hmm. up ahead. Uh, in March. Um, and I just want to take a moment and just say thank you to both of you and to the organizers of the Guadalajara Film Festival, um, Jimena uh, and uh, Vanessa, who we had earlier. Um, and just want to thank all of our audience here for joining us today. Uh, thank you. Keep making. We want yes. to hear your stories. And as always, not as you beautifully said at the beginning, every story has value. Every story should be told. So keep making your stories um, and keep talking with us. Uh, we're here for it. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Mil gracias, mil gracias. Um, and thank you both so much. Thank you, Julian. You're the best.